Hello, and welcome to this online seminar. I am Trisha de Jager, and on behalf of Oculus, I would like to thank you all for taking time to listen to this session. I would also like to welcome and thank our three guest speakers, Professor Alfart, Professor Kernan, and Dr. Savini. I'm sure the audience will greatly benefit from the knowledge you're going to share with us. This session will focus on the latest addition to the Pentacam family, the Pentacam AXL wave, with the topic, going beyond standard cataract refractive care. Without further ado, let's get into our first topic, my cataract routine with the Pentacam AXL wave. And this will be presented by Professor Alfard. But before you start your presentation, Professor Alfard, I have two questions for you. The first one, we live in an always changing and developing world. And this is also true for cataract practice. Over the years, what has stood out for you as key moments in the changes in cataract practice? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. And uh, hello to everyone who is uh, joining this uh, seminar. And thanks to uh, Oculus for organizing this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here together with Thomas and uh, Giacomo to talk about the Pentacom XL wave. Well, uh, we really have to say that there's a lot of uh, changes compared to like 10 or 15 years ago when we look at the diagnostics. When we remember the old times where we did a ultrasound uh, biometry measurements, and I remember the times when we had some uh, keratometry uh, machines, uh, kind of very old fashioned to measure the K values. And from that, we, we did uh, the surgery and uh, IOL selection. It has become a completely different surgery. Yeah. Uh, key moments were switching from ultrasound to uh, laser based, uh, uh, laser interferometry based uh, uh, measurements of axial length with a much, much higher uh, accuracy reproducibility, uh, having uh, the possibility of a an, an comprehensive corneal evaluation, which is much more than just two values, uh, K values, which really goes into the details of the corneal structure, of the um, asphericity, of the uh, uh, corneal values that are given, for example, by the pentacum, also of the internal uh, uh, side of the cornea, and so on, and that we don't need five or six different machines to get a patient through a routine, having five times uh, the addition of any kind of error or mistake that we may create. So we really uh, have a much more accurate, much more comprehensive uh, pre-evaluation and cataract surgery, which enables us to adapt that also to the surgical technique, yeah? doing specific lenses, choosing between a lot of uh, almost customized approaches in terms of intraocular lenses in our patients. So uh, a lot of things have changed. Brilliant. Um, you've touched on it with having more than one function in one machine. Where do you see with the Pentacam AXL wave? What do you see the future role of this device in cataract practice? Well, the thing is that... Uh, uh, Everyone has to think about if I set up a praxis or if I set up a structure in my clinic where the patient goes through a workflow, uh, how can we organize that? And the more simple and the more comprehensive it is, the faster it goes uh, and the less uh, problematic in terms of having uh, errors or mistakes, the better it is. So one measurement more or less gives you information uh, in, in five or six different areas, which is done in one moment, is of course a huge advantage. So the Pentacom IXL wave gives us so much information that we more or less only need that machine to prepare completely the patient and then can do the surgery. And uh, that is actually what a lot of people actually like. They want to invest in one machine that gives reproducible and also scientifically, scientifically controlled data, uh, uh, and therefore very reliable data. Uh, um, and that's it. It's simple to use uh, uh, by a technician. And, uh, and uh, this is what we need in the daily uh, workflow, because cataract surgery is, is a mess 
uh, type of surgery nowadays. It's not an individual thing anymore where you just do two cataracts a day. Uh, uh, so you really need also a very comprehensive and standardized approach to evaluate the patient. Fantastic. We are very excited to listen to you telling us more about this device. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm sharing here my presentation um, where we really looked in our hospital at the Pentacam RXL wave. And we're using the Pentacam for, for quite a while and also the different stages of the development of the machine uh, uh, from Pentacam HR to RXL to wave. These are my disclosures. We do research together with Oculus, uh, uh, and we've presented quite a bit of papers where we did comparison of different machines with the Pentacam. So, and this is one also part of this uh, presentation here. When you think about the Pentacam, the first thing that came into my mind when I uh, looked at this uh, to prepare this pre uh, presentation, uh, there's a lot of uh, similarity with the smartphone. Because uh, one thing that really changed uh, our lives in the last couple of years as a disruptive technology is a smartphone, which is almost one thing not, and that's a phone. Nobody really using it uh, most of the time as a telephone. Uh, that's an add-on we have, <laughs> so called like an extra icing on the cake. Uh, this machine can also do phone calls. But in reality, we use it really as a computer for all kinds of stuff, image uh, uh, Images are taken with a camera or videos are taken. Uh, we use this uh, navigational function with the GPS. We can also use it for simple things like a calculator, a watch, an alarm clock, a radio, dictaphone, answering machine, uh, playing with it or listening to music and, and so on. So we have machinery which combines a lot of things together and we adapt to that technology and put on that machine the stuff that we need in daily life. So I do my online banking uh, uh, and transferring, wiring money with a smartphone, uh, uh, not anymore on the computer or so. All these things we're doing and it becomes a routine. And uh, similar, I think, uh, is the situation if we have a diagnostic uh, system like the Pentacam, which now combines uh, really things that were not combined before, looking at the cornea, but also doing a retroillumination photo, uh, looking at uh, the lens, but also doing an axial length measurement, and so on. So we have a lot of features here that really makes this machine a kind of smartphone in the diagnostic of our uh, patient eyes. And as I said, one uh, measurement gives us uh, a, a big uh, variety of information that are impor important. So what are we, we looking at? Well, if you just look at the possibilities um, in terms of kind of fast screening or excluding pathologies uh, with the Pentagon XL wave, we look at, of course, comorbidities when somebody comes for a cataract or refractive lens exchange or even in the refractive uh, clinic for, for a LASIK procedure or something like this. Uh, we have the Berlin Ambrosio uh, screening for, for ectasia. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of refractive displays for corneal refractive surgery, the ABCD KC, or the keratoconus uh, staging and progression overview, a general overview also if we plan for uh, phakic intraoculans implantation, um, everything that we need for the cataract pre op display, also for IOL selection, uh, IOL calculation and so on is there, uh, including also new formulas or built-in IOL database. So we have a tool that, that you need in every cataract slash refractive uh, practice. And our cataract surgery by using premium lenses or presbyopia correcting lenses is a kind of refractive surgery anyhow. And uh, these two areas are really uh, growing together. So the new clinical application of the uh, Pentacam RXL wave uh, uh, includes the objective uh, refraction, then also a kind of visual performance analysis for the patient that you sometimes can really nicely use to show him before surgery what is a, uh, a reason, why can he see so badly, and also post-surgery uh, you can show him the improvement or if he has complaints, you can differentiate it's a corneal-based thing or it's an internal thing uh, or lens-related thing. Uh, and you can show that on the screen uh, to, the, uh, um, to the patient. We talk about the IL power calculation anyhow uh, later on. 
One thing that is important if you have a standardized workflow is uh, uh, the standardization itself. So one device for all pre and post-op, you know when the patient is sitting in front of you that all relevant uh, information have been taken already, which saves you, of course, uh, time. Of course, if you don't need five machines, you also save space, uh, as is, is clear. Um, it's easy to use. If you have a Pentacam, you can uh, upload your uh, data uh, and uh, unify the data so they are not lost. And uh, in the uh, um, RXL Wave, Pentacam is a huge uh, bundle and software included that gives you a lot of possibility also to, uh, for example, for me as a, as a researcher, to work with the data, uh, uh, update things, look at uh, correlations or things like this in, in my patients. But the thing is, is is it better to have everything in one machine or do we need to have specialized machines and the single machines that only measure refraction or this or that, maybe they are better because they are focused on it. Well, we, we did uh, some studies. So we compared the Pentacom mics away, for example, here with the iTrace, the Tracy, and the uh, machine from Nidex, the ARK1. Um, here we were interested in measuring refraction and high-order aberrations. We were also uh, uh, looking uh, uh, at this in the way that we did consecutive measurements, usually three measurements. We only use the data that we created if the machine itself gives us the res reference that the quality was okay. Yeah, so there are in some machines you have a have a whatever, a green light or uh, a sign that say QS equals OK or something like this. Every, every machine has a different sign to show you that the uh, uh, the noise, the measurement noise is OK. We don't have a problem here. So we compared uh, repeatability and the basic values of refraction, high order operation, third and fourth order. In this case, we, uh, we did consecutive measurements, but we excluded clear corneal problems like the keratoconus patient. And you can see here uh, also uh, the mean age of the patient. Uh, um, and uh, we used uh, 73 eyes. Actually, we had more eyes, but uh, if you measure with the different devices, you also have to look at what kind of aperture or diameter or zone you're measuring. And some of the machines have their own setting here. Uh, um, and for example, the eye trace provides uh, a pupil diameter and measurable diameter, which, is, which they call the scan diameter. And it can be a bit smaller than with the others. So in order to have an overlap, uh, uh, to compare all the machines, you say, okay, we only look at the three or two millimeters or four millimeters. And this, this way, um, with the three millimeter, we only had 73 patients, even though we had 109, uh, 110 actually, for, for the overall group uh, numbers of eyes. If you look at the repeatability of the spherical uh, uh, equivalent, uh, you can see here that uh, with the three millimeter zone, uh, you have a very good uh, uh, covariance. The CV means covariance uh, for the three millimeter zone, which is uh, more or less equal between the uh, NIDEC and the Pentacom device. A little bit different is the eye trace. ITRACE also stands out a little bit with different uh, uh, or higher standard deviation in the two millimeter zone. Here you can see that the blue, that is Pentacam, is very accurate, has a low uh, a covariance as well as it is three millimeter. So here the Pentacam is as good as or better than the others, as you can see here uh, quite easily. Astigmatic measurements uh, uh, different meridians, as you can see here, uh, uh, again, two and uh, three millimeters, we have a very good uh, overlap between the Pentacom and the eye trace, as you see here. Uh, uh, the ARK is a little bit different in terms of the values that they had, but otherwise they were pretty pretty good here. And if you look at the so-called uh, blend altman curve, uh, which really shows you that there are not hundreds of outliners here, uh, uh, you can see that there is a good correlation between the Pentacom XL and the ARK here with three millimeter, and a little bit more distribution here between eye trace and uh, ARK here. So, but it's, in general, it's a very good uh, agreement. Looking at the astigmatism, uh, 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 you see here also that it's a good agreement between Pentacom and ARK here, very, very close uh, together. 
uh, all the points. Uh, a little bit more distribution here with the eye trace. We feel that the eye trace is a very nice research tool. Actually, we need for for other things like accommodative measurements and stuff like this. As a routine uh, thing, uh, we prefer the Pentacam here actually, uh, which gives us more standardized values that we that we need. Talking about the value of the values, the second study looks at the reproducibility uh, of data. Um, so here we looked uh, at uh, um, the patient's 60, uh, 64 eyes, where uh, we didn't exclude, uh, 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 where we did exclude uh, keratoconus patients uh, uh, or post-LASIK patients, but otherwise uh, took uh, consecutive measurements, three uh, of these patients. And we had different uh, technicians or opticians actually doing the measurements, so it was not in one, one hand, because as a matter of fact, uh, using the machine is, is very easy. So looking at the high order uh, aberration here, total cornea four millimeters down, uh, you see that we have uh, an average value here of 0.19 uh, or 0.2 uh, microns. Standard deviation is, is very low as you can see. And if we look at the first, second and third measurements, uh, we almost having identical measurements. It's really a very, very small uh, variation here and three consecutive measurements. Looking at the spherical aberration, uh, it's on like a, a four and six millimeter zone. Uh, you see the value here, and you also see very low uh, standard deviation. And again, here, if you look at the whole pox plot between the first and third or second measurements, almost zero uh, changes. The cord mu is similar to uh, angle kappa. Uh, it's called cord mu here at the, uh, at the pentacam. Uh, giving uh, you an information about uh, the uh, the optical angle. And you also see here a very low uh, standard deviation again. The absolute value is not so relevant. The standard deviation is important here. And again, you can see pretty good uh, uh, agreement between all the measurements uh, and very low number of, of outliners. So we have a very high repeatability in measuring total corneal high order aberrations. Uh, this is, to my, uh, for example, very interesting for multifocal IOL uh, selection. We just had uh, several discussions in, in some of the other uh, forum, forums or in some of the other meetings uh, when uh, uh, multifocal IOL is not so good to implant. Uh, uh, what value is important for us? Sonica 4, maybe more than 0.5. A lot of people agree that this is not so optimal for multifocal lenses. And we didn't even discuss about these things uh, before we had machines like the Pentagon. So it's quite interesting that we can set the standards for this kind of uh, IOL technology based on the new diagnostic uh, possibilities. And otherwise, we have seen we had a very good outcome. Um, one thing that is also important is how does a device behave if you have kind of complicated eyes? So let's look at here at the silicon oil filled eyes where um, the um, IOL master, for example, has like 20 years of development time to adapt to that fact, because uh, you have to adapt with that and you have to have a correcting factor if you make this, uh, mach uh, use this machine in these eyes. And uh, we were more or less the first that used uh, uh, the Pentagon IXL wave in silicon oil-filled eyes. And again, we did uh, a study where we looked at this and it, uh, the measurements and so on, and same setup. And we could see that there is an offset compared to the IOL master with a silicon oil mode, which is implemented there, by 0.82 millimeter in terms of axial length, as you can see here. And uh, using this kind of data, you can adapt that, put that in the software. And then suddenly we have a complete agreement between the two measurements here, 2497 versus 2496. Uh, and also standard deviation is almost identical so uh, we can set the offset of the pentacam to a point where we have a mean difference uh, in terms of axial length measurement in silicon oil, oil field eyes only of 0 0.005 millimeter, which is not really relevant for IOL calculation. So this is quite good. And that with a simple study, we can already set up uh, uh, an offset here. And of course, the studies will be uh, confirmed with, with further evaluation. But even these complicated eyes uh, can be uh, ma managed. 
So before I finish here, I'm almost running out of time. Uh, just a small case uh, at the end. A uh, patient comes to you, uh, complains of loss of vision quality in dimmed and dark uh, light condition, has a problem uh, driving, especially in the evening or when sunset. And the only uh, interesting thing was a myopic LASIK uh, 20 years ago. And you all remember how we did LASIK 20 years ago. It was different type of refractive surgery than, than we do today. At that time, around four to five di diopter. It was plano, but shifts a little bit to near side now. So you may just think, okay, maybe he, he has a little bit of regression and gets myopic again, but uh, you, of course, have to look at it. And if we look at it, we get all these measurements here. You see he is slightly myopic more, but not really so much more. And otherwise, uh, uh, we see here astigmatism and stuff, but we also see here that the image, uh, the visual performance image, is not, not clear. So we understand why he is complaining. So what are the optical elements? We can look at the cornea. Maybe we think that the uh, uh, LASIK at that time, uh, with whatever laser uh, uh, and whatever technology done, uh, uh, has has caused some high order aberrations or something. But you see here a pretty nice image of the cornea uh, um, influence. So the cornea is actually quite okay. The total uh, uh, internal uh, uh, view looks like this, and you can see that. The problem comes actually here from, from the lens. So the patient is getting to an age where he gets presbyopic uh, uh, and has uh, a slight cataract, which causes the problem. Now, if you want, and you can also see here uh, a little bit of uh, pacification. So if you want to do a cataract surgery, for example, in this case, you can, of course, use all the data you have already to un analyze a compromised cornea in terms of uh, status after LASIK. So look at these values and also look at the axial length and everything in order to look for an IOL calculation, which you already get in your hands here. And it's adapted uh, uh, to the fact that this is a LASIK uh, candidate, uh, uh, post-LASIK, uh, myopic LASIK, of course, I, and the uh, Pentacom can already calculate for you the lens that you may uh, like to to use. So to come to the end, the clinical tests of the Pentacam showed really in our clinic very good results for uh, all the factors that are important for me if I deal with cataract and refractive patients in terms of uh, screening uh, uh, before surgery or looking at these patients after uh, a surgery or if they have some problems. Uh, premium IOL selection is, is uh, supported in many ways, uh, not only in terms of measurement data, but also look uh, for vision quality. I can look at certain things. And uh, the uh, uh, total uh, wavefront uh, measurements that can actually be also split up in corneal and total wavefront and internal wavefront, I think is very good. And uh, so we use it in cataract as well as refractive surgery uh, a clinic and setup and especially also after cataract surgery or if uh, externally operated people are sent to us with complaints, then we can do a compre comprehensive evaluation with the Pentacom and can offer them a way to solve these problems. So that's a small idea here about our services. Uh, what we uh, do at the Heidelberg University, corneal interventions, refractive surgery, cataract refractive surgery, IOLs, phakic, and also, if we do all the vitrectomies or keratoconus related things, uh, with the vitrectomy, we always do an IOL calculation but because very often you combine that. Uh, so you also need to know uh, a lot of parameters. And keratoconus, of course, uh, speaks on its own. So we think that uh, the learning curve is, 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 is more or less zero here. We just shift from an updated Pentacom to a, to a newer one. The science behind all the numbers and uh, repeatability and uh, the uh, um, accuracy is, is extremely good. And also the machine tells you uh, if, a uh, if a measurement uh, value is not really safe, then you can repeat measurements and see if the quality is, is okay. So we're talking here about the next generation and the best of both worlds, so to say, with the Pentacom IXFL wave really combining uh, all features that we need in, a, in our patients. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Alford, for that very informative talk.
Before we move on to the next topic, I would just like to inform everyone that the mode for the silicon oil filled eyes, Professor Alfart mentioned, will be available in the next software update for the Pentacam AXL and also the Pentacam AXL Wave. So our next topic for the evening is the Pentacam AXL Wave for refractive cataract surgery. And this will be presented by Professor Conan. Professor Conan, before we go into your um, presentation, um, I have also two questions for you. We've heard now about changes in technology, changes in devices, but similar to devices, IOLs also keep evolving. From your experience in your clinical setting, do most patients nowadays ask or inquire about premium IOLs? Um, well, I, I, I would say not. Well, many patients are more informed than five years ago and definitely more than 10 years ago. So I think there is an increase of the premium IOL channel. And I think that the patients are more informed now. They come and we, uh, we very often see that they ask us, can you do something for surgery that I don't have glasses after surgery and cataract surgery? So I think, yes, people are more informed and, and, and the choices are very important that you as a cataract surgeon uh, going into the refractive cataract surgery because people are asking for that. When you decide your patient is a candidate for a premium IL, what is your decision tree or what is your prerequisites to offer a specific IOL for a patient? Well, I think, uh, you know, you can, you, we can make a long talk out of this, but I, I would say two things which, which come to my mind, which are important. Number one is what does a patient want? We always ask him, we, we need to understand what the patient is actually, you know, expecting from the surgery. And according to this, then I do the examination which we will talk about in a minute. And according to this, I can tell him what my you know, options for him are. So said this, I think that then it comes into play that you do all this pre-examination and you get to understand what his cornea is, what is, you know, what, what, what uh, you know, the lens status is, what the macula is, everything is there together. And then you get, then you come up with a conclusion what you can offer the patient. So it goes and still in the direction of a little bit, you know, um, uh, under promise, but over deliver uh, is always good. But, you know, don't talk too much that you can actually achieve everything. But in conclusion, patients are more informed nowadays and uh, you have to do good examination and then, then give them a good solution or let's see good options, I would say. Fantastic. You can start sharing your presentation. We're all excited to listen to you. So my talk is on Pentacam AIDS Airway for refractive cataract surgery, as we talked already in the introduction. And um, here are my financial disclosures. Um, as the University of Heidelberg, we also um, consult for companies uh, who produce IOLs. We talked about that, and also companies who um, you know, work in that field. And you can see a big part is actually the preoperative examination. And Oculus is one of the companies. And you see here, we are consultant, we are lecturers, as we do today. We also have grant support because we do several studies over the years. Now, I think we covered this, that simply biometry you know, has been sufficient years ago, but as patients evolving, as patients want to see after surgery, cataract surgery, refractive lens exchange for near, intermediate, and distance, you know, there is an extensive biometry necessary, a lot of work we, you should do before you uh, perform the procedures when you go in the area of refractive cataract surgery. And Gerd Alfart talked about this, that there was a development just a summary, you know, in 2002 at the AAO, the Pentacam basic model was introduced. 2007, the Pentacam H, uh, HR, which had a better technology in order to perform. Then the AXL in 2015, which included axial length measurement. And then recently, a year ago, the AXL wave was introduced by Oculus uh, for our ability to screen patients. 
So th this is the device. You saw this already in Professor Alfred's talk. Um, this is a machine. It has a large screen there. And you see a lot of um, basically features here, which I would like to highlight a bit of it. So the measurements with the Pentachem XL wave, which are introduced, are the Scheinflug based tomography. You all know this because you, you followed the Pentachem most likely, rotating Scheinflug technology. And with the AXL, we have optical biometry, uh, contact free axial length measurement with Korean interferometry. Um, is the basic model of Pentachem AXL. If you add then the wave, so the question is, what is new? The AXL wave is the enhancement of the AXL because it uses a Hartmann Shack wavefront sensor for total eye aberrations and objective refraction. It uses retro illumination. And I show this here. This is the wavefront aberrometry of the entire eye. It has the objective refraction, a feature which I come during my talks, very important, and then ritual illumination for further features. So on top of cornea, axial length, you now have also wavefront measurement, objective refraction, and ritual illumination. So for us, what is the benefit in the university clinic pre-surgery? That was one of the questions we, we were given in the beginning here. The... Uh, screening of the anterior segment is very important. Screening for ectasia, fuchsia, uh, fuchs endothelial dystrophy. The objective refraction, every patient, wavefront measurements, total cornea, crystal lens, total eye, assessment of reasons for visual disturbances, uh, as we already have heard. Is it caused by the cornea? Is it caused by the lens? And then two different pupil diameters are also taken. It's the mesopic and the scotopic measurement. And the end, optical biometry and eye well power calculation. We also will hear about this. So this is the screen here. We, we have to spend one minute here. Look at this, this, this information on one screen. You have an iris image, which gives you the mesopic pupil. Here you have the retro illumination. You know that you can really see something in the eye in terms of cataract, in terms of um, is there maybe already an IOL implanted many information with retro illumination, which is important. You see the photopic pupil size. You have then the image quality. They have the high order aberrations, which are also shown here in terms of total eye aberrations, but also in terms of high order aberrations. And you can see here the refraction. I come to this later. We have the axial length measurement with an average axial length measurement shown here, 24.376. In this case, also, okay measurement, good, okay. This is the Scheinflug imaging. This is the total corneal power. We will hear in the last talk about this. And then the tomography with the K values of the curvature of the cornea, and that's important. The next thing is here the Pentacam fast screening mode. Very quickly, I don't have too much time to explain this, but you have this screening mode which goes to glaucoma screening in terms of chamber angle, it goes to the corneal densiometry to evaluate on Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, so a corneal disease. It goes to the Balin ambrosia, which gives you an indication of a subclinical keratoconus. It goes through the corneal refractive power map, and all this is compared here in this fast screening so that you have an overview of this patient's eye in comparison to a big population. And you also have an op uh, opacification of the lens, uh, which also turned out. For example, here, if this is in green, in the literature, the, 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 the opacification is not very uh, much. If it would be here, you, as an example, and I can go through all these devices, see all these special uh, features, you will find this, what this particular patient had um, in, in his eye, uh, according to the uh, comparison. So what is the beneficial or the clinical benefit uh, post-surgery? It's you can get objective refraction, high order aberrations, including circular aberrations and coma, retroaminulation with positioning of the eye well, again, the wavefront, the assessment of visual performance. And here is a screen of this visual performance. You see here, that is the visual performance of the cornea. 
the internal wavefront and the total wavefront. Remember, you can separate this. It's like an aberration, like we, we used to this when the aberration measurements came out or uh, came on the market. You can separate the cornea from the internal and then from the total. You see here the curvature map, axial with astigmatism. You see retroillumination, and you can also see with this high order aberration measurement the refraction of this eye in this particular case only very slightly myopic and some cylinder at this patient. We did a comparability of subject and object of refraction, retrospective study, very quickly, Pentacam versus eye, uh, eye trace. Uh, we did subject and refractions by a trained optician, uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria I would like to skip. We did a comparison of the mean and standard deviation with the Pentacam AXL. And here are the results already. You can see the repeatability of this device 123 eyes, spherical astigmatic component in the mean. And you just see here the standard deviation at the two, three, and four millimeter zone were quite small. This is important. And the results of a comparison between the eye trace and the pentacam is shown here. Uh, again, you can see here that there was a mean spherical equivalent, which is uh, showing at the pentacam and the eye trace and the repeatability, three consecutive measurements with both eyes were actually, or with both devices were done. Um, you can see the repeatability again in this slide results from this study, and it shows the standard deviation quite small with the pentacam, a little bit higher with the eye trace at the two millimeter zone. In terms of looking at subjective refraction and objective refraction, you can see here the mean and max, for example, hyperopic eyes and myopic eyes, and you can see what the objective refraction to the subjective refraction when an optician has done it. So they were quite similar. So you can take with an objective refraction, you can mimic what your optician actually has done. I think that's very important. Shows a high accordance with the subjective to the object uh, um, to the objective refraction. Uh, in this particular case at the three millimeter zone, very comparable. And this shows it again, just another way. So in conclusion, the Pentacam XL wave had a higher repeatability in sphere and astigmatic components than an also used eye trace component, slightly better. And then the, the uh, wave gives you an objective refraction, shows a high correlation with subjective refraction. Let me go back here. I would like to go to two examples very quickly. Calculation example, a 74-year-old patient, hyperopic, small astigmatism with cataracts, uh, strabismic, uh, strabism amblopia, uh, 1995 diagnosed. The patient desired glasses, glass independency. So we looked at the fair screening report for cataract. You can see the number here. Um, as I pointed out, that's the other side. So we make our assumption. We look at the cataract pre-op map, which gives you axial curvature, the total corneal refractive power, and so many other things like corneal curvature, K1, K2. It also gives you the total corneal refractive power. It gives you the central corneal thickness, 545. It gives you the apex, the pupil size, uh, at different areas. Unfortunately, this is a German version here, but uh, it also gives you the anterior chamber depths, and it also gives you the total corneal astigmatism and the spherical component, which was quite low here, and the irregular astigmatism. So a lot of information, right eye, left eye, same thing, full screen overview, just as an example here, axial length of 24 millimeters, with visual performance and all the measurements. Right and left eye, we did. With the Oculus Pentacam, the IOL calculator, um, actually we took here the measurement um, of this patient. We look here with the Barrett 2 formula. In this particular case, we were looking for slight uh, emetropia. And we selected the patients also shown here in the IOL calculation in comparison to another way of calculating the lens, so 19.5, 21 diopters um, with the uh, calculator of Alcon. 
Also Barrett, 19521 So very comparable to what we have seen with the uh, um, Oculus uh, correlation and what we found one month post of the very good outcome. Remember, the patient had an amblyopia, so 2020 in the right eye, uh, 2030 in the left eye, good outcome for this particular patient with a slight astigmatism. We even get this patient to 2020. Second, very shortly example, 56-year-old patient um, with reduced visual acuity, also want to be glasses-free, right eye was dominant, and see here, the patient had basically um, a hyperopia slide here, but a huge hyperopia in the other eye, which was not explainable, scotopic pupil size here. And if you look at the full sequence overview, you can see here, let me go back one slide. You see that is a normal axial length, but if you look at the other side, you saw this flat cornea, and we were wondering what that patient had. It could be any type of refractive surgery of corneal flattening, like PRK smile, femtosecond LASIK procedure. Um, but you see here again, also the aberration of this cornea was not very good. And the fast screening mode also showed, um, you know, some red colors. So cornea topography again showing here the flattening. What could it be? Cataract. And in the left eye, we found a radial keratotomy, which you can very nicely see on this um, Oculus Pentacam corneal densiometry measurement. You can even see the incisions here at this case. So important next steps, very quickly, we uh, looked at the IOL and I was asked what uh, is our choice in this. We had previous RK IOL type. We used an IC8 pinhole IOL, as you can see here. Calculation was done with the Barrett formula in this because we had prior RK and we also looked at the uh, comparison with the uh, Pentacam and 1929 diopters, um, target perfection half a diopter, cataract surgery will be planned, and we had done the surgery. So for me, in comparison or in summary, when I look at the Pentacam AXL wave for refractive cataract surgery, my take-home message, number one, it's our gold standard for screening. We, use, we looked at the Pentacam development, basic, then the HR, AXL wave, AXL, and then AXL wave. I think that's a great development over the last 15 years, so to say. You can see the device here. We have now the refractive cataract screening tool, full sequence overview, visual performance option, fast screening report, cataract pre-record, Bill and Ambrosio for turning out or ruling out subclinical character corners. We have an IOL power calculation option, and also we can do our post-op controls in terms of IOL positioning with reiteration um, tool. So in summary, this is a very interesting device, which is our gold standard for refractive cataract surgery with this development, with the options here, and also with the post-optive control. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and to take care for the future. Thank you very much, Professor Cronin, for sharing this very informative talk. We're moving on to the last topic for the day, and that is solving the mysteries of difficult IOL calculations and post-op surprises, which is going to be presented by Dr. Savini. Now, Dr. Savini, hard topic always is toric IOLs and considering posterior astigmatism. Do you, everybody know that the posterior surface contributes to total corneal astigmatism do you always use measure posterior astigmatism in your calculations, or are there cases where nomograms are sufficient? Uh, well, I always use both. I like to see them at the same time, one side, uh, one by side, so that uh, I can see if there is any discrepancy. Uh, I do this uh, on uh, my own calculator, which is uh, on the website of the Italian Society of Ophthalmology, and I do the same on the Pentacam IOL calculator, uh, 
so that I can see uh, what can be done with the direct total corneal astigmatism, which are the calculations, and which are the calculations with the Barrett calculator, which predicts, estimates uh, the contribution of posterior corneal astigmatism. In most cases, there is no difference between the direct measurements and the predicted measurements. Uh, so if I see that there's no difference, uh, I feel very comfortable in the selection of the toric IUL. When I see a big discrepancy uh, in low astigmatism, I prefer to rely on Barrett calculator, let's say uh, below 1.5 diopters of astigmatism. I think that the repeatability of anterior measurements and their optimization is better. When I have a higher astigmatism and uh, mm, there's a discrepancy, usually I prefer to rely on direct measurements. Then my last question um, for you is, in many eyes, the steep axis of the posterior surface has a vertical direction, yet it produces against the rule astigmatism. Can you please explain to the, the audience why? Uh, the um, the uh, answer relies on the negative power of the posterior corneal surface uh, because of the difference between the refractive index of the cornea and the aqueous. So uh, everything is uh, the opposite of what happens on the anterior surface. So if you have a, uh, a vertically aligned steepest meridian, this produces an against the rule refractive astigmatism and the opposite to when uh, uh, the steepest meridian is uh, horizontal. So it's just um, a matter of refractive index. But what I would like to highlight is that with the pentacam, you don't need to focus on the posterior surface. It, it's, it's much better to directly focus on total corneal astigmatism, the power distribution display, which is my preferred display of the, on the Pentacam since it was available, because you don't have to make any mathematical addition or, or subtraction. Just go straight on on re corneal retracing and uh, use that value from the machine. This has to be entered, and this is the basis of the Savini Toric calculator available on the machine. Fantastic. Um, you are now the presenter, so you can start sharing your presentation. First of all, again, I want to thank uh, Oculus for this invitation. It's an honor for me to be here. And I was asked to uh, show some interesting cases of difficult IOL calculations and post-operative surprises. So I collected a few of them since uh, I got the uh, machine, the App Pentagon AXL Wave. And these are my financial disclosures. And I will present four cases that I think are quite interesting. The first one uh, is about a 55-years-old man that uh, had the previous uh, refractive surgery. I uh, saw him uh, uh, just after the lockdown in May, and uh, he had the corrected distance visual acuity of just 0.3, uh, regular flat cornea after LASIK, as you can see. There was a nuclear catara. The astigmatism, the keratometric astigmatism, which is the difference between K1 and K2, was slightly below uh, one diopter, and it was slightly lower with the total corneal astigmatism within the power distribution display. A very long eye, 30 millimeters. And uh, this is one of the most beautiful things that you can see on the Pentacam wave. Uh, when the patient asked me, why cannot I see? Uh, well, as I did before, if you show a display like this, where the internal quality of vision is really awful, you, it's easy to show directly show to the patient uh, what's happening in his eye. And uh, I said, okay, the internal optics of the eye are not working anymore. They have to be changed. You see, the, the cornea is not so bad. And how can I use the Pentacam to make a calculation 
in post LASIK eyes. Here you see that the target refraction for this eye was minus 1.5, and this was one of the reasons why I did not want to correct that little astigmatism. Probably if I aim to emetropia, I would have correct even 0.7. And uh, you see uh, the different options available, uh, easily available on the Pentacam. Uh, that means the Barrett 2K, uh, the Hill Potvin Shamas, post myopic, post myopic, and uh, now we have also the Olsen ray tracing, uh, which is a, a, a a ray tracing that takes into account every little point on the cornea, a great advantage. And you see that the calculation was ranging between 16 diopters and 17. Then uh, I always like to compare the results to the most important sources, like for example, the ACRS website. Here again, you have the Barrett that provides of course the same numbers, and you have some other methods, like masked formula, which I like a lot. And in this case, we have the, uh, the masked formula uses the uh, laser-induced refractive change, which was minus 7.5. And uh, in many studies I've done, I saw that it is a very good formula, which was providing a, a, a lower number, 14.5. So, we, I decided to rely on Olsen rather than Barrett, because Olsen uh, is ray tracing, and I love ray tracing, and implanted 16 diopters. And if you take a look, uh, the one-month postoperative refraction was minus 1.5 with minus 1 of mm, a cylinder, a spherical equivalent of, of minus 2 diopters, which was exactly what Olsen predicted before surgery. And uh, one more reason to love this approach. And if you look at the post-operative display uh, of visual um, uh, quality, it, now the internal optics is perfect, especially if you compare it uh, to the preoperative one. This was a, a, dif a different post LASIK say, uh, case, because astigmatism was higher, still a long eye, but when we look, and here you see the, the, the old measurements, when we look at, at the uh, uh, cataract, pre-op cataract display, we see quite a, a high, um, higher order aberration, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 microns. I do not like so much this number for multifocal IOL, which is what this uh, 45 years old lady from Japan was asking. So should I implant a multifocal IOL in a case like this? Mm, I'm not so enthusiastic about it. You see that total corneal astigmatism was around two diopters, 1.9 at 100 degrees. And so my choice was for a toric monofocal lens in the bag, and a few weeks later, a trifocal piggyback. So that first, with the monofocal toric, I was able to correct uh, the, uh, to, to reach a metropia, and if there was any mistake, I could, an spherical uh, refractive error, this could be uh, corrected with the add-on lens in the sulcus. And if the patient was not happy about the quality of vision with the trifocal lens in the sulcus, this could be easily explanted. So two reasons to select a two-step surgery. Again, I relied on the all center retracing um, calculation that suggested a 16.5 lens and a T4, and final refraction was planar. So uh, again, uh, the calculation uh, was very good. 
And here you see that after adding the multifocal lens in the sulcus, the quality of vision is still good, especially if you look at the total. Please consider that internal optics is not perfect because there's a toric lens in the back. So what you have to see is the addition of the two, which is almost perfect. So very good vision and the patient was satisfied. Third case, an unhappy patient with a multifocal lens. That uh, this was a, a young uh, 54 woman, a lawyer. So when you have to deal with a lawyer, you immediately stay very, uh, take a very uh, the maximum attention. She was looking for spectacle independence, but had no cataract at all. And moreover, she was slightly myopic, so she was used to a perfect vision for near. When I looked at the uh, cornea topographies, you see that uh, there's a, some steepening and some asymmetry, but this was out of the pupil side, of the pupil area. So I warned the patient, but said, okay, this should not be a problem because inside the pupil area, the bow tie is regular, so astigmatism is regular. We can go on with the trifocal lens toric in the um, in the bag. So again, here you see that uh, the steepening is out of the pupil, and I was not afraid of a night driving problem because this woman was not driving the car, so not a big problem. Here again, you take a look at the pre-op cataract screening, and you see that uh, total higher order aberration at four millimeter was okay, 0 .9, 0.09, so much lower than in the previous patient. And here you see the calculations made by the Pentagon Wave with the uh, Haggis and Barrett formula, uh, which take into account the ACD and are among my preferred choices. I selected the 17.5 diopters. I just want you to focus on the right eye because their left eye did not have any trouble. And one day after surgery, visual acuity was just 0.4 and this was the first eye and the patient was very unhappy. And I was very scared about this because I had a lawyer in my face. There was no corneal edema, no inflammation, and at the slit lamp, it was impossible to understand what, what was going on. I was not able to understand which, why such a low visual acuity after surgery. Let's go to the Pentagon wave. And you see that the internal E was almost perfect. So no problem for, from the IOL. While the corneal was not perfect. And if you take a look at the map, you can see that the corneal steepening had moved from outside to inside the pupil area. And you can easily see here from uh, the comparative, uh, the differential map, here you see the pre-op with the steepening outside and the one day map and steepening moved inside the pupil area. And you see here also in the differential map. And this was sufficient to decrease the visual quality to have just a point for visual corrected. corrected. It, it, she was plain also. This was the maximum. Little by little she improved. And uh, because the steepening came back to the original position, probably this was a, a mild subclinical edema, and so the curvature came back to the original one, and uh, after three months, the patient was happy, and the cornea topography was the same than preoperative, -op, pre and the case was resolved without anything else. And here you see that uh, 
uh, now patient was okay after one surgery and the cornea was good. Everything was good after one month, after three months. If you take a look at the aberration, and uh, you can see that uh, one day after surgery, higher order aberration was where 0.258, uh, three months, is, it, it, they decreased to just 1.15. Last case, a man with uh, cataract and epithelial basal membrane dystrophy with uh, uh, corrected distance visual acuity of 0.5 before surgery and quite irregular cornea. You see at a slit lamp, the map dot fingerprint pattern. And you see that both cornea and lens are not good. And this is mainly due uh, to the uh, epithelial uh, to the uh, epithelial membrane dystrophy. I had to explain this to the patient that uh, the, the source of the visual complaint was not entirely on the, uh, in the lens, but also on the cornea. There was some astigmatism to diopters of, cor of total corneal astigmatism. And you see that uh, the calculation, as I usually do, for um, the toric lens were very similar between uh, the Savini toric, which is just the total corneal astigmatism by Pentacam and Barrett. In both cases, a T5 acrisoft was suggested uh, with a very slight difference uh, uh, in the um, uh, spherical equivalent. I implanted a, a 20 diopters because I wanted uh, some myopic. Uh, uh, refraction after surgery, I selected a T5 lens and uh, as, uh, I said to the patient that I want to do intraoperative uh, corneal disepithelization to improve the regularity of the uh, cornea. And uh, this was the situation after surgery. You see that the cornea three months after surgery is much better. Uh, the uh, dystrophy so far is okay. And there was, uh, uh, there were some vari variation in the spherical equivalent and postoperative correct distance visual acuity, little by little improved from 0.5 to two weeks after surgery to uh, more than 1.2 at three months. And again, if you take a look at the cornea now, is much better than what was before surgery. And again, the Pentacam wave is useful to show this to both ophthalmologists and patients. And now I, I would like to conclude with uh, uh, some numbers because we did uh, some studies uh, and uh, this is still in press on JCRS. Uh, it's uh, the study that compared many new formulas with uh, Pentacam AXL measurements, you see that we investigated 14 formulas with the newest one, the, like the EVO, uh, the Holiday 2 with axial length adjustment, the uh, LADAS, uh, artificial intelligence, NASER 2, uh, the Kane formula, RBF, per DGS, so everything. As you know, uh, it's important in this kind of studies to calculate the prediction error as the difference between the measured and the predicted refraction. And a negative prediction error indicates a more myopic result than the predicted refraction. And these are the, the numbers. I want to show to you that with almost all formulas, we got more than 80%, more than 85% of eyes with the prediction error within half a diopter, which is an excellent number, if you, especially if you compare these numbers to those published by Mellis with the Landstar in their big study on 13,000 eyes, where the best formula, the Barrett, was reached just 80% of eyes with, within half a diopter. Now, with all formulas by the Pentagon, we are around 85%, 80-85%. And the Barrett, for example, had 86 with the Pentagon versus 80% with the Lensdown. Okay, we cannot compare these numbers, these papers totally, because 
different sample size. But anyway, it's a confirmation of the good outcomes of the Pentagon. And even better, the numbers of eyes within a quarter of diopters with the per DGS by Damien Gatinel uh, and uh, the Belle Manier, with as many as 63% of eyes within a quarter of diopter. And here, formulas are ranked according to the percentage, the per DGS, Barrett, Evo, RBF, Kane are the best, with more than 85% of eyes. We did similar studies with also with the Toric, unpublished one, and Panoptics. And you see that with the Panoptics, we are above 90% of eyes within, uh, uh, within uh, half a day after. Almost unbelievable. So using standard case, the measurements of the Pentacam Excel can be used to achieve refractive outcomes that are equal or better than those reported with traditional optical biometers. Constant optimization, optimization is still a mandatory step, but this can be done directly on the Pentacam. Please be aware that a small percentage, around 10% of eyes, uh, still have a prediction error over 0.5 diopters, and this may need uh, a LASIK, and the patients must be uh, warn about this issue, because if this happens and you told them about this, it will not be a big problem. A few more slides about the uh, Pentacam measurements uh, after in, for IOL power calculation after lay, myopic LASIK, we published this year this paper showing that uh, some formulas like one of the formulas that I developed, the triple S, and the musket formula provide excellent outcomes with 70% of eyes, uh, even 76% of eyes within a quarter of diopter, uh, half a diopter, sorry. So excellent numbers with the measurements from the um, Pentacam AXL. In this paper, you see that the Barrett was not excellent. This was fully no history method, just 52% of eyes. So when uh, uh, Professor Barrett uh, saw these numbers, he asked me, oh, this must be something wrong. We analyzed the data together and came out with a further paper, uh, which was co-authored by uh, Professor Barrett. He focused more specifically on the Barrett formula. Well, there are four 2K formulas for post-LASIK eyes, and they are all available on the Pentacam or on the APAX website. Because you can have a full no-history Barrett formula if you don't know anything. Then you can have a full history Barrett with a measured posterior corneal curvature, and all the possibilities, just refraction of just posterior corneal power. And of course, the best results are obtained when you have everything. So if you have the history and you enter into the Pentacam IL calculator, the refractive change minus 7.5, and you have the posterior measurements from the Pentacam, you get the best outcomes. If you don't have the Pentacam and you don't have the posterior measurements and you don't have the uh, uh, refractive change, then the accuracy is lower. And uh, this is a, one more reason to use the posterior corner curvature measurements on the Pentagon. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Savini, for this brilliant talk. Um, we have answered some of the questions that, that has come up during the sessions in the chat function. So in line of, with time, I would like to thank all the presenters for your fantastic talks. I would like to thank all of you who attended this session. And I would like to wish you uh, a good evening, a good day. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye again. See you. Good night.